Hi everyone, uh, welcome to week 8 with UQCS. So this week we have Jenna here giving a talk on bioinformatics and uh, computational science for medicine and beyond. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jenna. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to come to talk today. Uh, as Lina said, um, my name is Jenna uh, and my presentation is computational science for medicine and beyond. Uh, so I'm a third year bioinformatics student and the reason why I wanted to come talk to you today uh, is because um, the most common thing that I get when I tell people what my degree is, is what's that? Um, so I think it's really valuable for computing students to be aware of the kinds of things that they can do in life sciences and what they can do with their degree in the life sciences. So can I just get a quick show of hands who in the room uh, is a computer scientist or a mathematician or a software engineer with no biology experience? Awesome. And does anyone, any of you guys have any biology experience? Yeah, awesome, yeah. Um, and then any biologist with some computing experience? Yeah, awesome, awesome. Okay, um, so it's really cool that we've got a few people from different backgrounds. Um, the aim of this presentation is to keep it nice and general. Um, I'm not gonna go in, into anything too detailed, so if you're coming in uh, either from a data science background or a biology background, you should be good to go in understanding everything in this presentation. So the plan for uh, this presentation is I'm going to give you a really light introduction to molecular biology, just so everyone knows the terminology that we're talking about. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about what bioinformatics is uh, and what a bioinformatician does, uh, who a bioinformatician generally is, um, also some in research and industry avenues in bioinformatics, uh, and a little bit of my work as well. Okay, so um, a lot of you might know that DNA is often referred to as the blueprint for an organism. Um, but what does this actually mean? How does this DNA get translated into um, something that can be used to build, to essentially build an organism? So there's something called the central dogma of molecular biology. This is the foundation upon which molecular biology is built. So this foundation is that DNA is transcribed into RNA, that's how to say RNA, not RNA, sorry, um, and then translated into proteins, right? So just to give you a bit of context as to where this is happening, the DNA lives in the nucleus, the RNA is produced in the nucleus, and specifically mRNA, which is translated into proteins, uh, gets exported outside into the cytoplasm, into this space, uh, and converted into proteins by a ribosome. So in bioinformatics, we can collect data from any one of these steps, right? And depending on what step we collect it from, uh, will inform, uh, provide different information about that organism. So this leads quite nicely into the idea of multiomics, right? So the idea that you can have different kinds of omics for different kinds of data. So we have just a few examples here, genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. I've just put a couple notes in. Genomics is all the genetic information material, not just genes, because there are, is genetic material that aren't genes. Transcriptomics is all RNA, not just messenger RNA, or RNA that gets translated into proteins. Uh, and proteomics uh, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the data are related to proteins. So this is not even like exhaustive at all. Uh, there's many more and the subcategories of each of these kinds of data as well. So for example, there's something called metagenomics or all of the genomes, all of the genetic uh, material of every single organism in an environment, which is most of the research that I do is in metagenomics. So just keep in mind that depending on what kind of biological analysis you're doing, um, you'll have different kinds of omics data. And when people refer to multi-omics, uh, this is kind of what they're referring to. Okay. So, what is bioinformatics? Uh, can I just get some uh, from the crowd? Just if you want to put your hands up, do you have any examples of what bioinformatics is or what you associate with bioinformatics? Yep. Going with biological sort of data sets? Biological data sets, cool. 
Anything else? Yeah? Simulating biological processes. Simulation, also? here. It's a sub-discipline that involves using computer technology to collect, store, analyze, and disseminate biological data and information. Um, so this is a bit formal. Um, I'll break down what this means and what this looks like. Uh, but bioinformatics isn't just one thing. Um, it takes many different kinds of skills, and that's kind of what I want to emphasize in this uh, presentation, meaning that you don't have to be a wet lab biologist to participate in biomedical you can come from a data science background, not knowing much about biology, uh, and still have some sort of role in it. Okay, um, this is not really the focus of the talk, but um, I think it would be incomplete if I didn't talk about biological data collection. So, development in this field, in engineering, biochemistry, and genetics, uh, is a huge driver of innovation in bioinformatics. Without precise and accurate sequencing data, we wouldn't have the drive to develop good quality computational skills or models, uh, to good quality computational tools or models. So without these developments, bioinformatics doesn't look like what it does today. Uh, if you don't know what sequencing is, sequencing is the process of determining um, your genetic sequence from a biological sample. So you um, prepare your biological sample, uh, you can run it through, this is called um, a limited peak, uh, you can run it through all of these machines, uh, and you'll output genetic data that you can analyze. So I could talk for 60 minutes about sequencing, it's definitely not my area of expertise, uh, and it's a bit of a science within itself, uh, how to prepare samples uh, to get what kind of data you're looking for. Uh, so I won't go too much into that, but I think it's good to keep in mind um, that biological data collection uh, and the quality of these samples is equally as important, if not more important, than having good computational advancement in the field. The next thing I'd like to talk about that's quite an issue in bioinformatics is the biological data storage. So genomic information is set to become one of the biggest demand, demanders of storage, um, overtaking YouTube, Twitter, and astrono astronomy data, which in the past has been uh, the biggest consumer of storage. So in 2019, 25 petabytes of sequencing information is produced, um, and every seven months, um, this doubles. The amount of uh, information produced doubles. So you can imagine how much that we're producing now. And the reason for this is because sequencing machines have become a lot cheaper. So what happens is that there's so many different sequencing labs around the world, whereas maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was only 100 or so around the world. But now there's probably thousands. So what's happening is that there's so much decentralization in this data. It's coming from all over the place. It's not necessarily being stored in the same way, and it's not necessarily being stored consistently. Um, and we also just have a lot of it. There's a lot of data that hasn't been analyzed that's just sitting there waiting for something to be done with it. Um, and what happens when we have this rise of data, this really unprecedented rise of data, is that we also get these ethical and privacy issues, which arise in any kind of data storage, but genetic information is so sensitive. Um, and with the collection of different dimensions of data, uh, as we said, we have multi-omic data, and that's all being stored together. The more dimensions that you collect, the more uh, you increase your risk of being able to de identify someone. Okay? There's so much information you can draw from genetic material uh, that this is really needs to be really secure. Um, another scary thing is that private companies are also collecting genetic data. So stuff like Ancestry.com, 23andMe, they collect genetic data and there isn't currently much policy uh, to protect that data, to protect people uh, from having their data sold. So this creates issues with um, insurance companies and employers having bias 
Uh, it could also create um, economic issues if this data were to be leaked. For example, if you have a really high profile figure and their genetic data was to be leaked, you can imagine the consequences if they tend, happen to have a genetic disease, um, what would happen to their company, stuff like that. So it can also influence economics as well. Um, so it's not just genetic testing, it's also health and fitness apps, things that are tracking you all the time. Um, that data is also being stored by private companies. So we aren't really sure at the moment how secure this data is, and that's definitely an issue that needs to be developed more. And this is something where software engineers, data scientists, cyber security need to get involved, uh, and also policymakers need to be informed about what can come from genetic data and what could happen if there was a catastrophic or just even a minor leak in data. What could happen to the individuals? So I think that's just important to uh, touch on, and that's kind of a field where you don't really need to be a bioinformatician to care about that or to know about that, um, but there's definitely a demand for people who know how to deal with data and know how to keep it safe. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is biological data analysis. Sorry, that was a bit heavy. Um, but the goal of biological data analysis, this is where I probably highlight, um, is to make sense of biological data using computational tools and mathematical uh, techniques. Um, I would suggest that the development and use of this tool, of these tools, falls under biological data analysis. So it's not just the statisticians and the mathematicians uh, and the computer scientists involved in this area. Uh, you also need a fair amount of molecular biology to inform what you need to do to that data. What information are you trying to get out of it? How, do you understand what kind of um, omics that data is? Do you understand what should be there? So while it's really useful to have statistics and a computational science background here, there needs to be some collaboration with molecular biologists to understand what you need to look for as well. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is biological data dissemination. So this is the application of that analysis. What does this data mean in a biological context? And can it be used to answer a question, perform a diagnosis, um, or to lead to further research? So this is why your biochemists, molecular biologists, or clinicians um, are involved, and they're using your interpretation, a data analytic interpretation, to inform what needs to be done next, right? Um, so uh, I'd just like to point out that um, both the biological and computational knowledge here are really important. Uh, one is not more important than the other. You cannot have one without the other. Um, but these don't need to be from the same person. This is a collaborative effort. Um, and as computing students, I would assume you'd lie somewhere on the computational side if you were interested in getting involved um, uh, and being a part of life sciences. So where did this come from? Because bioinformatics didn't look like this. Um, hasn't looked like this always. It's looked like this for about past 30 years. So it was actually coined in the early 1960s, and we didn't even have the hypothesis of a desktop computer then. We didn't even know what DNA really was, which is quite interesting. Um, and the first bioinformatician, Dr. Margaret Dayhoff, was a physical scientist. She was not a, a computational scientist. She was not a, bi a biologist. Um, and her contribution to the field uh, was she made the first piece of software uh, that could assemble proteins. So in the 60s, they had a sequencing technique where they got little protein sequences and they needed to be assembled back into a whole peptide sequence. Uh, so what she has done, had done um, was made a program that used punch cards and the uh, IBM 7090s. Uh, to assemble these sequences, and this is the first example of something called de novo sequencing. Uh, yeah, de novo sequencing, assembly, sorry. Uh, which is assembling something when you have no idea what it should look like. So it's quite interesting that bioinformatics is being done 70 years, well, 50, 60 years ago, um, before we even had any kind of technology or understanding that we do today. Um, and I also wanted to point this out because I think it's important that 
you know, women of science get, uh, have their representation because uh, I hadn't heard of Margaret Dayhoff before this and I work in her field. So um, I think that's really important as well. Okay, so I expect the question, who is a biomathematician? Who calls himself a biomathematician and what does a biomathematician do? Right? Uh, it really depends on who you are um, and where you're coming from. So there's lots of biologists who use computational tools to analyze their data and to interpret their data, but they really don't have a statistics or a computer science background, and that's perfectly okay because they don't need it. They are just using the tools um, and using that to inform their biological conclusions or their clinical conclusions. Um, and there's lots of com computational scientists working in the field as well who really don't have an understanding of biology or an understanding of biology that's deep enough um, to uh, draw those conclusions or perhaps they're working under a clinician um, and they're uh, they don't have the medical background needed to draw those conclusions either. Um, so I think what uh, can be uh, concluded from this is that the nature of like an interdisciplinary field such as bioinformatics, which draws from statistics, biology and computer science, not one person is the expert, and that's why I find it so cool, is because there's a place for everyone uh, within this field. And a place for everyone to um, use their expertise and to collaborate. Uh, one of my favorite things about working in bioinformatics, uh, just the minimal experience that I've had, um, is that you get to work with so many different kinds of people. So you learn so much by doing that. Uh, and you're never ever the expert no, like not even my supervisors are the expert ever um, because they're always asking questions, they're always collaborating um, and no one knows everything and I really love that. Hey, oh, that's okay. Um, so uh, the second, probably the second most popular question that I get asked when I say I do bioinformatics is, is it all just research? Is there any pathway beyond bio, like biomass research um, that you can follow, right? So there's absolutely industry pathways because um, you know you don't hear about it a whole lot, uh, but industry does rely a lot on the understanding and the synthesis of genomic data. So areas like digital and precision healthcare, personalized drug therapy, which um, means that you are analyzing the genome of your patient and you're targeting specific genes that they might have that would be associated with the disease, right? So you identify which genes are associated with that disease and see which ones they have and then you can target the pathways that those genes would influence um, such that they can get the most effective and direct drug therapy that's possible. So this is really useful for diseases like cancer, where generally the approach is just kill everything, right? It's really harmful for patients. Uh, it usually doesn't lead to good outcomes. Um, and uh, it can take people off their feet for years. So something like personalized drug therapy is something where you, know, you need a lot of computational analysis and informatics analysis uh, in order to implement. Diagnostic and test development. Um, this is something uh, I worked in a little bit, uh, working in uh, generative models for uh, chest x-rays. Uh, it wasn't directly bioinformatics related, but this can definitely be applied to genomics. Um, the integration of artificial intelligence into healthcare uh, is you know, increasing, uh, and there's definitely a need for people with informatics and computational science experience in that field. Um, I'll also mention creating UI for cl clinicians because clinicians don't generally understand computational uh, science uh, techniques uh, and they need to have something that's easy to read, something that's direct and something that it makes sense to them, right? So this kind of leads into the idea of something called interoperability where you take data from different sources and you can converge it into one source that's nice and easy to use um, uh, and uh, you know, direct for the user. So 
creating new ice clinches is also an important problem in uh, industry as well. Uh, I'd like to touch on environmental science as well. Um, so pollution reduction and mining uh, can be addressed using bioinformatics. So if you take the, something called the microbiome of an area and analyze it, we can see trends in what those microbes uh, you know, have. Do they have anything in common that allows them to survive in an environment? So think of environments like um, mining sites, heavily polluted lakes, things with heavy metals in them. Why are there microbes living there? What are they doing? Like, why are they, how can they survive in such a toxic environment when everything else is dead? Um, and that information can be used to help reduce the pollution in that area or for mining as well. Um, I'll also mention <coughs> climate change quickly. This is not something I've worked with or read a lot about. Um, but you can also analyze microbes for cup to see if they are, uh, collect carbon, accumulate carbon, um, and that can also be used to address climate change. Uh, and probably the most, the highest employer on this list, agriculture, um, with livestock and crops. Um, this is, you know, big money industry that requires data analysis uh, and to, you know, increase the uh, efficiency of agricultural industry. Um, and, you know, a really um, old fashioned approach to this would be just to breed your crops and your livestock until they come out the way you want them to. Um, but we don't need to do that anymore. We can do that, we can sequence their genome for a fraction of the cost and inform the owner of those livestock and crops as to what um, they need to breed together in order to produce what they are looking for. Okay? Or that can also be used to, um, I guess, grade crops and livestock as well. Um, it's cut off a little bit, but we also mentioned software engineering just a little bit. This applies to all of these industries, by the way. Um, because the storage and distribution of biological data, because so much of it, every industry that uses genomic data needs software engineers who can deal with that. Um, and again, you just have so much biological data that it just needs to be kept secure. Uh, it needs to be kept in a place that can be accessible uh, for everyone that works in the company as well. Um, it's cut off a little bit, but um, I want to talk about manufacturing. Uh, so specifically, uh, looking for enzymes that can be involved in manufacturing. Um, so some industrial processes uh, require extreme pH, extreme salinity, uh, or extreme temperatures to proceed, right? Um, and the manufacturing industry is really interested in what enzymes can do this and how can they find them because there aren't a lot of identified extreme files or things that like to be in extreme conditions um, identified in the literature. So that's something the industry is also very interested in. Okay, uh, there's also the food science industry. So uh, what kind of bacteria um, what kind of genome does the bacteria used in the dairy industry hold? Um, and, uh, you know, the process of fermentation, um, what kind of uh, proteome is uh, produced by that? So that kind of information can be uh, really important to the food science industry. Um, in addition, we also just have biotechnology in general. This is a really high, um, high, a high entrepreneurship industry, biotechnology. Um, there's a lot of startups, even in Brisbane, uh, working on software that can be used to analyze genetic data, um, that can be used to uh, display or visualize genetic data for different audience, audiences, um, and can be used to make predictions as well. Uh, I'll talk about a few more of those companies uh, later in the presentation. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that while, you know, you won't get paid as much as something like uh, FinTech, um, there's definitely opportunities uh, in industries, particularly if you have a computational background, uh, for people to get into it. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be in academia for your whole life. Um, I'd like to quickly...
quickly talk about um, my research and a little bit that I've been doing over the past year. So my research project that I started in June last year uh, was to bioprospect thermophilic enzymes in hot springs. So just a fair warning, this is slide is biologically heavy. Um, um, I will try and explain it as best I can. Um, and if you don't know what an enzyme is, that's just a protein that is a biological so we're looking at proteomics here. So what I was doing here, I was looking at a metagenomics data uh, and a metagenomics analysis of the Enox hot springs. Uh, I was looking for something called homologous enzymes or enzymes that likely have common ancestry. The hypothesis is that um, if you have common ancestry, you likely have common function, right? And it's a hot environment, the microbes there likely have enzymes that can survive at really high temperatures. Okay. So there's only 11 thermophilic P450s, so P450s are enzymes that perform metabolism and oxidation. Um, there's only 11 thermophilic P450s that are known, or at the time of this research were known in the literature. Um, and there's hundreds of thousands of identified P450s. So they're really rare, they're really hard to find, and people just don't know where to look for them. So we just try to fit, you know, to make, take a simple approach. If they're in hot things, they probably like hot things, right? Um, so on our, but through our analysis, we identified 231 putative proteins. Um, so these are proteins that likely are thermophilic, but we're not quite sure. And many of these were independent biological systems. So that means that they had proteins around them that helped that enzyme work outside of the organism, right? So that's really interesting for uh, industrial applications because uh, these enzymes can likely be used by themselves without having to have the whole microbe there to function. Uh, this is an example of in silico experimentation, which is why I wanted to include it. Because in academia, in silico experimentation using bioinformatics is super common uh, in the biological fields. Um, I actually don't, haven't heard of many genomics research being, or many genetics research being done recently without having the in silico experiment done first, using bioinformatics. Um, so now that we've narrowed down some proteins that probably are right, we can uh, you know, have a more informed hypothesis going forward into the wet lab, right? You're not just poking around the dark. So this work is currently being um, continued by uh, some of the to Boss um, and his team. Uh, so they're doing something called expressing these proteins, uh, where you genetically engineer E. coli, for example, uh, to produce this protein so you can get it by itself, uh, and then you isolate it and see if it does the thing you want. So that's where this research is going. Uh, but I'll talk a bit about how we actually found these proteins. I'll just stand over here so I can point out what we're doing. So I said that we used 11 thermophilic proteins as our training data set. But what were we training, right? Um, we were training something called a hidden Markov model. A hidden Markov model is shown down here. I will explain what a Markov chain is actually first. So a Markov chain is where you have a system where the current state only depends on the previous state. Um, an example, that's an example of a first order Markov chain. Right? So the difference between a Markov chain and the hidden Markov model is that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the path taken, or between the sequence that you output and the path taken to the model, right? So there's only one path you can take through a Markov chain to produce a particular output. In this case, we're talking about sequences, so I'll just keep referring it to those sequences from now on. All right? With a hidden Markov model, there's many steps, many ways you can go through the model, right? So this is the architecture of this, with these numbers being probabilities, right? There's a probability of transitioning to uh, these bases. So bases, nucleotides, just the AC to the G's and T's, right? This is the probability of staying in the state, and this is the probability of moving to the other state, right? 
The states in this model are fairly arbitrary, um, but they're meant to represent uh, an extra variable in the model that I'll talk about in a little bit. I'll just explain this a little bit more. Um, so the reason why this is hidden is because you don't know what state it's going through, right? You don't actually know what the path you're taking is. So unlike a Markov chain where you, it has to go through a particular path, right? This, uh, in a hidden Markov model, you don't actually know which path it's taking. So it's got some level of stochasticity to it, right? So the reason why we would use a hidden Markov model and just not just a regular Markov chain is because in sequences, um, sorry, I'll just point out that this is a protein sequence, not a genetic DNA sequence. Protein sequences are, have 20 letters rather than four. Um, and they all represent the amino acids, so like the building blocks of a peptide. So these are your amino acids. Okay, so the reason why we want to use a hidden Markov model is because these amino acids don't actually have to be the same as each other um, for them to be homologous, for them to have common ancestry, right? They can be different to each other. Um, as long as they're not like a key uh, amino acid in that sequence, or they might have similar chemical properties, it's probably not going to change the function of that protein too much, right? So when we're looking at biological sequences, we want to account for this. That's the variable that we're accounting for when we're using the transition between states. The transition between states, it might be more than two in this case. Um, I don't actually know how many they use, because it's hidden. Um, so if you're transitioning between states, um, that means you're transitioning from one possibility of that amino acid. So maybe, for example, this column, you're transitioning from being an E to an A, right? You're transitioning between the possibilities of what that sequence could be. So um, I was having a chat to a few people today and I was really confused. I was like, no one know what a hidden Markov model is except biomaticians. But this happens to be the reason um, because they're really useful for accounting for that transition between states, right?
turn them onto an ancestry tree. Uh, what organism are they likely, are they related to, what are they likely, um, what do they likely belong to? Um, and once we've classified them, we have an output of sequences that belong to a certain organism, um, and we know that the program has classified them as homologous to the original training set. Does that make sense? have been trying to model this for a really long time as, you know, 
Um, as long as we have the data to do it, they've been trying to model it. Um, there is, the problem is, right, there isn't a lot of data from 60,000 years ago, or 100,000 years ago, or 2 million years ago. There's just a lot of genetic data that survived. There's some, but not a lot. We've got massive gaps, right? So the problem is, how do we accurately, accurately enough, predict back, right? Predict the sequences back. Right? The closest that I've seen someone get is they predicted a little organism that likely had a cell membrane, um, a ribosome, and some plasmids in it. Uh, but where did that come from? How did that evolve just out of nothing, right? Did it come on an asteroid? Did it, like, did it just spontaneously appear? Did it spontaneously get created out of, uh, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon? Um, how did that occur? And then how did that evolve into what we are today? So that's a really awesome question that requires a lot of computation, uh, a lot of computation in math um, to figure out, to make accurate predictions backwards. And uh, it's still something that people are trying to answer today. Right? Spatial multiomics in single cells. This is a bit to unpack. Right? So spatial multiomics refers to taking an area of a biological organism. So let's say a tumor. You take a cross section of a tumor. And you're looking at the expression, the genome expression, in different cells in that tumor. And what we can do is we can categorize what part of those, that tumor does what, or what part of that tumor is responsible for what, based on its genome, right? Based on what genes are expressed in that cell. Okay. So single cell, uh, single cell sequencing is really useful because instead of having bulk sequencing data, um, we can have data from individual cells because cells uh, actually have different kinds of uh, genetic material because they're responsible for different things. Okay. Another cool uh, area of mathematics is unraveling the layers of the epigenome. The epigenome refers to uh, the uh, genome that is in an organism once uh, it's affected by environmental factors, I'll say. So your genome doesn't actually stay the same throughout your entire life. Uh, and the idea of epigenetics is that it changes uh, based on chemical responses uh, to stimuli, right? So that can be changes in the environment um, or changes uh, as you age, right? So epigenomics um, and understanding uh, how it relates on a computational basis um, is also a really important area and it's quite new. Uh, in developing from a bioinformatics perspective. Okay, uh, and the last thing I'll point out is automated protein structure prediction. So you might have heard of AlphaFold, which is Google's um, prediction protein structure software, uh, which uh, takes uh, protein structure from a database and formulates a prediction for that, and then you can search for that protein in AlphaFold to get some sort of prediction. But what if you could just, you know, type in a protein sequence and automatically get out a protein prediction, right? That's a protein prediction, this one up here. Okay, um, this is the protein prediction, right? Um, so a protein doesn't just, isn't just a list of amino acids, it has a 3D shape. Uh, it, it's made up of chemicals, so those chemicals are going to interact with each other uh, and fold to make some kind of shape, right? So predicting what these shapes are and how they interact with each other and how they bond together uh, is a really cool machine learning topic as well. And how to automate this, because doing it by hand is very, very tedious. Okay. So, if you've liked this presentation and you want to know a little bit more about bioinformatics or computational biology, um, I would recommend some of these courses. Uh, they don't have too many prerequisites, uh, particularly SAI 2100, STAT 3306 if you've done STAT 2003, um, and COS 3500 and 2500.
Um, of course, there are the biology corsets, but uh, they do have a few more prerequisites that you might not have met in a computer science degree. Um, but these should fit into a computer science degree as well. Um, and if you don't want to take more courses, if you're full, um, but you still want to learn a little bit more about bioinformatics, uh, there's always free courses uh, from Harvard and edX as well. Um, if you want to get into bioinformatics and you just have a straight computer science background, that's not a problem, but it always helps to have some context about what you're dealing with, and you're a lot more employable in that field if you have some biological experience as well. And I'd also like to point out some Brisbane-based companies that work in genetics. Uh, if you're interested in looking out for these companies and uh, I'm looking for potential positions. So Max Kelson is an AI company. Uh, you might have heard of them. They don't just do genomics, they do lots of stuff. Um, I think they work a lot in the insurance and um, honestly, I think they just work a lot all over the place. I don't know exactly what their projects are. Uh, they also do some stuff in quantum computing, which is pretty cool. Uh, NeoJet is a really large international corporation. Uh, focused on agricultural sequences, particularly livestock and cattle in Queensland. They're based out of Ipswich. Uh, and they have a big need for data scientists and bioinformaticians as well, uh, just because they have such a high throughput of data as well. Uh, there's a company called Conquer, um, which looks at biomarkers. They're a startup in Brisbane. They are looking at biomarkers uh, in research as data. Uh, and there's also QCIF, which is based on campus. Um, they're a bioinformatics uh, company. They do bioinformatics for researchers if they need to outsource it, uh, is their main shtick, but I think they also do other stuff. These are just the ones that I could think of at the top of my head. There's also other biotechnology companies in Brisbane uh, that offer a lot of um, data science and bioinformatics uh, positions. Um, but yeah, so here's just an example of some if you wanted to keep an eye out for them. Alright, thank you for listening. Lovely, thank you so, so much, Jenna. Um, UQCS loves having people in from all walks, and it's nice to see an interdisciplinary area. Um, from UQCS, one of our special oh, speakers, Mugs. Um, uh, people should be back with pizza soon, and thank you.